Welcome to In An Instant. My name is Ben, and today we're shooting with a film that I absolutely never thought I'd get a chance to use. This is Kodak PR44 film, a briefly produced instant film type. I'm both vibing and vibrating right now. Let's do this. A kind of photography that would become part of the human being. Press a button and have the picture. All right, folks, we are out here about to take our first shot on Kodak Instant Film. It's absolutely insane. I can't believe we're here doing this right now. Never thought I would have the opportunity to do this. Keep in mind that Kodak Instant Film went out of stock, went out of business. Kodak pulled out of the instant film market in 1986. With that in mind, Integral Film, which is what this is, dries up really quickly. So having the opportunity to shoot this is extremely uncommon. And I don't know how many of these packs even exist still today that anyone could possibly shoot. We are very fortunate today because our main man, Mike, um, his username is right here. He's the one who sent this camera over. He had a pack in here. He found that it was working and was like, wow, let me contact Ben for a minute instant, which is an incredible gesture. He lets us, he's letting us shoot the rest of the film in this camera. And he gave us some notes to go off of, which I love. He says he got this single pack from an estate sale of a former Kodak employee. Um, and he believes he must have stored all this film in ideal conditions. Unfortunately, this was the only pack of Kodak instant film in his collection. Um, so what's insane about this is that he got this from an employee in Rochester. So that means this was stored in conditions that possibly no one else has this film in. It's really cool. Um, he mentions that this is uh, probably unnecessary but interesting info. It's exactly the kind of info that I personally love. There were at least two formulations of Kodak Instant Films with different ISOs. The earlier film was 160 ISO, and this film, the one we're shooting with today, is 320 ISO. The film was not made to work with this camera, but probably by desensitization over the decades and some random dumb luck, it seems to work perfectly now. <sighs> I've had the shot cooking in my pocket and I have not even peeked at it. So this is gonna be our first look on whether this shot even worked at all. Okay, it did not. As you can see, that first shot was, um, well, not what I expected. Mike Tebow, who lent us the film-loaded camera, had gotten solid fidelity out of the first several shots in the camera. So when this came out, I was like, well, f that's not ideal. Honestly, I don't know why the image came out like this. Uh, there's a softness and a massive light leakiness to it, but who's to say? I mean, this film is over 30 years old. There's probably 50 reasons why this could have happened. There's 50 ways to leave your lover. It does have real like aura vibes though, if you're into that kind of thing. In this moment, I thought, dang, we might've lost our opportunity to use this and I'm gonna have to throw this video concept directly in the trash. But as we were leaving this location, Lauren got a handle on things and thusly, we got to feel the tremendous relief of seeing an actual gall dang image after a swift crank of the old handle and a few seconds of developing time. This is insane. It was really hard to fathom what I was even looking at. This is a film I never thought I'd have the chance to use and experience, and frankly, I didn't think it was even possible that this could work anymore. Um, I'm so thankful to Mike Tebow for giving me the opportunity to use it. So thankful, in fact, that I'm not gonna make any Tim Tebow references, nor to the fact that I used to Tebow everywhere, and that was kind of a thing for me. Anyway, we did not stop there. We needed redemption for the first Lauren shot. It was important to me as we only had a few chances to make the images carry some significance. At the same time, I didn't want to sit on this film for too long and try to attach some sort of time-consuming conceptual shoot to it because I felt like this is a ticking time bomb and we needed to fire this off immediately. And um, it's kind of cool that we got to use it in the snapshotty way it was originally intended. That being said, with the rarity of the film, getting a picture of Lauren was a must for me. Something we'll always have is a memento of the fine fortune bestowed on us by the GAWD god. Mike Tebow, so we tried it again. It's time to be like Soldier Boy and crank that. Whew. It feels good to crank it, I gotta say. And now that we know we have working film, the crank is like phenomenal. The next one developed perfectly fine. I cannot believe the results on this 35 year old expired Kodak Integral film. This is ridiculous. Uh, it doesn't even have any spread issues. Color has this wonderful almost 2012 Instagram filter-esque warmth to it. A great image fidelity, really fun grain, and a fascinating texture to the print too. 
a sort of a semi-gloss matte, and there's no ridge where the image and the border meet. Uh, it's completely smooth, like my friend Mike's beautiful head. Kind of an interesting note about this film is that it is the later produced trim print film. Uh, this film was designed to have the added feature of being able to detach the base of the film where the pods are after it developed so that you could have a clean image and it would look more like a regular photographic print. Weird idea, but I love weird ideas. Let's try and do it with this bum shot of Lauren. It's like peel apart film and integral film in the, in the same film. Oh, it also, it smells surprisingly good. It smells like laundry detergent. I, okay, I, I might be, I'm not, I'm not having a stroke. Another interesting element to the Kodak Instant Film Unit is how similar the back of the film is to Fuji's Instax film. I've covered this a lot on the show, but to quickly summarize why these films exist at all, Kodak was jealous of Polaroid's success with peel apart film in the 1960s. They wanted to make their own instant film too. Polaroid says, nah, that's our thing. And then Polaroid released Integral SX-70 film. This is like the film we use today. Then Kodak decided, heck, with intellectual property and released their own integral film in 1976. Polaroid immediately sued them. Kodak continued producing this stuff for 10 years during the lawsuit. And so finally Polaroid triumphed and Kodak had to pull their film off the shelves. All Kodak instant cameras were bricked with no compatible film. And that was the end of that song until these pretty little notes we played today, right at the end of the album. Little bonus track. One of the ways Kodak attempted to skirt around the patents that Polaroid held regarding the film and the camera design was to have their film exposed from the back. And that's how Fuji's Instax film works too. Fuji developed their instant film product with assistance from Kodak during the lawsuit. So they have this very similar structure as a result. So similar in fact, that their first releases, Photorama film, could be easily modified to work in these Kodak cameras. But it wasn't really available in the US very widely, so it's not like a lot of people did that. Plus, that film was discontinued in 1990, so RIP, IP, rest in peace, in peace. With a shot left in the tank, we attempted to capture my cousin, Sandy. Is the lens centered with you? Because I can't tell. No. All right. Now we crank. Watch me whip. That's a different song. <laughs> and we sort of, sort of got a result. It's, it's not good. Blurry as if it was close focused or something, which isn't even possible on this camera. So I suppose we can chalk that up to the oddities introduced by time. It doesn't even look like the same issue as the initial aura shot. I'm very thankful we even got two images out of this whole thing. Mike Tebow the God. Shooting PR44 film and even being able to briefly experience Kodak Instant Film at all is truly a gift. Really makes me wonder what could have happened had the lawsuit not gone Polaroid's way. Uh, it's underrated how much the consumer lost as a result of that case. Was Polaroid right to sue? Yes, Kodak stole their shit. But the sheer volume of cameras that suddenly didn't work is staggering. You see them in thrift shops and antique stores all the time. Not to mention Kodak ultimately had a great product. Some of these cameras sucked and looked ridiculous now. Certified doinkers of the highest order, but the film was great. It's essentially the equivalent of Instax today. There is of course always the question as to whether Kodak would have discontinued their instant film at the very first sight of panic, but who knows? If they had kept it around, it would have outlived Polaroid and maybe we'd have all been shooting Kodak instant film today. This possibility will be explored in the Marvel In An Instant crossover series, What If? But for now, all we can do is speculate as to whether our squad up in Rochester can muster the courage to look fate in the eyes and resurrect pack film. Thank you for watching In An Instant. Get a handle onto that subscribe button. Stay tuned for more shoots, breakdowns, reviews, and all things instant. Bye.